Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Shop Talk Park Slope. And this time around, we have Jonathan Lee, who is the owner of Sip and Play Cafe. Hi, Jonathan. Hello. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me today. So let's get right into us. I think, again, the name of your business, like other businesses in the area, is a little bit self-explanatory in the title, but uh, let's tell people what they can do and enjoy when they go to Sip and Play Cafe. Yeah, so Sip and Play, we're a boring cafe. You come here for friends and family. It's like a small fee just to sit down right now. It's like $10 a person for three hours of game time. You can enjoy oh, our entire library of games. We have over 500 games to play from. And while you're here having a good time, we also have food and drink. Um, so that's in play in a nutshell. Yeah, and it's really like, I because, and I guess this kind of leads into the next one. It's like, it's a really cool concept. And yet it's not really one that you see. <laughs> Like, yeah, very much because I can literally only think of one other place that does anything like this, and they're in the village. They're not even in Brooklyn. So yeah. how did you come up uh, with the I idea for a board game cafe? Yeah, yeah. Funny enough, the one in the village is actually the one I went a lot in uh, high school. Really, the inspirations behind Sip and Play for sure. Uh, that's definitely where I kind of had my board game journey start. I guess if you really want to put it like that. Um, but yeah, it's super niche and I just feel like it is so niche just because how many people are into board games and then also wants to open a business, um, with their, I guess, like passion or hobby. Um, I feel like it's pretty rare to meet those kind of people for sure. And so, so you wanted so basically you, so you loved board games and then you also wanted to combine that with your love of boba tea hence the sip in the sip and play cafe but you also offer like some food so how were you able to kind of like bring like all of that together i guess like it's kind of like i, I mean i guess then again it kind of leads into the next question in terms of like i guess that that's basically you really had to think about all that in terms of what kind of space you ended up finding right yeah exactly so funny enough before sip and play like had you asked me years ago when i was still in school Oh, what did you want, want to do in college? I actually really wanted to be a chef, and um, I was working oh. in the restaurant industry for like three to four years along those lines. And I was really into wanting to open my own restaurant at the time. Um, things ended up not working out. Um, I had a physical injury. I ended up leaving the industry for good because it's like a lot of physical labor. So that's when the idea came to be where it's like, okay, let me pivot to another passion of mine, which is board games. But funny enough, Sip and Play is more of a restaurant than I expected it to be mm -hmm. because our whole angle is that a lot of boardroom cafes don't have um, much food or drink. They focus on the game aspect a lot. So we really wanted to push that where, you know, I grew up with bubble tea. That's like my heritage. All my friends love bubble tea. I really wanted to represent that. And also all of the menu items are kind of like my own creation in some ways, even though they're all like relatively simple sandwiches. Um, that's like my culinary side shining through. So I like to look at simply kind of like in a, like just a congregation of like who I am as a person in like a brick and mortar. Yeah, no, I could say now that I know that you actually had a background in wanting to be a chef, that actually makes like a lot of sense. Actually, yeah. that you're you, like you truly were able to like cobble together your the various like important aspects of your personality and actually express them through a business which is really cool because totally you said it's it's rare for somebody to actually have an opportunity um to do that and actually kind of like speaking of the food it seems like a lot of the um items are kind of like conducive to snacking and playing <laughs> so was that, that was kind of like a thought like in terms of having things where it's like you can munch a bit make your moves or munch and sip and think about what your next thing is going to be and everything so so were you kind of intentional in like the menu items that you were thinking about most definitely i feel like a lot of the menu items especially our appetizers they're all like group size portions mm -hmm. because when you're playing board games it's always a group or maybe it's like a date at the very least so sharing food while sharing the experience of a board game, it kind of like comes full circle with that. Yeah, no, that's a really great. And also I can imagine that having food and drink on premises is actually a great way to get people to 
stay because sure. they don't have to leave when they're hungry or if they want, you know, want something to drink. So <laughs> exactly. And I feel like um since the time session is like three hours, it is a long time. I play a bunch of games and uh, while you're there, just like snack a lot. Yeah, exactly. No, that's what say. You, you, you're like, you're like that, 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 that's some great forethought there. <laughs> so how did you land on opening your shop up specifically in Park Slope? Yeah. So when we were searching for a space, things that came to mind were wanted to be in Brooklyn. That's where my family was based and that's where I was living. I'm still living in Brooklyn, but we just wanted to be close to our uh, store. Mm -hmm. But also just seeing, okay, where do boredom cafes thrive? Um, I feel like they thrive where there's families. Park Slope is a very family oriented neighborhood, I feel like. Um, also, we're close to a lot of schools. It's definitely a great after school activity. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, Park Slope did not have like doesn't have a boardman cafe. Um, I feel like it's kind of the perfect neighborhood to have one. So we really focused in on Park Slope. And thankfully we found the space and um, opened January, 2020. And I could also see Park Slope being a great location just because it, it does have kind of a bit of centrality to other mm -hmm. neighborhoods, right? So it's not that far. So somebody who is in Windsor Terrace or Prospect Heights or somebody who is over in Sunset Park or Greenwood Heights or somewhere else, you know, it's like, it's not, it's not that far for them to come. Yeah, this is something that they really want to do with their friends and stuff. So yeah, friends and family. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really great. So you, and again, you said, okay, so the date you said you open. You open right smack dab in the pandemic. Means <coughs> you had to make some adjustments <laughs> to your plans. Yeah, so you weather that. Yeah, that first year was incredibly rocky um, because when we opened in January 2020, we only had heard about COVID just like overseas, and it wasn't mm -hmm. exactly incredibly serious at the time, right? But obviously, mid March when it hit New York City and we had to close everything. Um, it really halted our momentum, which was really, really bad. Um, because when we first opened, we actually had a lot of media coverage where New York One interviewed us, CNBC, we had an article in Time Out, and we we're getting all of this publicity for all of that to just come to a grinding halt where like mm -hmm. no one could hang out. And that's our entire business model. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. So we ended up closing up until May because we started to notice other businesses in the neighborhood opening again. And we had to pivot our entire business model, right? Because there's no indoor dining. So we turned into like a blockbuster-esque or like a library where people could rent board games and enjoy them in their homes. And at the time, it was actually like really cheap, I feel like. It was like $5 a game. You rent it for a week. Mm -hmm. And we actually had like a big community reach, uh, come out and enjoy that model. Because in the pandemic, people were also looking for things to do at home. Yes. And yes. a great thing is like they, all of these games they've been meaning to try. Now they have the time to try it. Mm -hmm. And they don't actually have to commit to the game because all board game hobbyists know. We've all made the mistake. I've done it plenty of times. We buy a game. It's expensive. Games are expensive nowadays. They're like $60. We play it once. Maybe it didn't really hit or like it didn't really click with the group. And now you're kind of stuck with this game, right? Mm -hmm. so it's really exciting for a lot of the hobbyists in the area. They can try like a lot of our games while also um, getting some food and drink to go. So we became like a boardroom cafe delivery system almost or like a to-go thing. So that's how we survived. Um, up until they did the whole 25% indoor dining, 50% indoor dining, and checking temperatures and things like that. Now, I think that that is, was a brilliant idea. Um, yeah. just because it totally makes sense, right? Because it's like, if you're stuck at home with your family, that's something, you know, or your roommates or your partner yep. and stuff. That's something that's like a little bit different that you could do. And again, because you have all of these games, right? Because actually, I think... I had initially thought it was like 300, but did you earlier say it was 500 now? Yeah, we've been expanding the collection ever <laughs> since. So it's 500 plus now. Exactly. So with that many, yeah, so with that many games, it's like, 
people could just, you know, come and you really can just try completely different gaming categories and stuff. And also, I think that, you know, for people who, you know, are fortunate enough to actually have, you know, a ma- that magical space known as a backyard, right? mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know, still, you know, that was a way that you could still, you know, invite your friends or other family members over and everything else and still have like a safe way to get together. So I really think that that was a brilliant, that was, I, I, there was a bit of a show of genius <laughs> on your part uh, to figure out that that's how, uh, that that's how you should handle stuff. Like actually, as a matter of fact, do you guys still have that rental system in place as part of your business or is it solely only you, you still have to, you have to only come to the cafe? Yeah. So we ended up stopping the rental side of it and it's because we want to cater to the people coming into the store Mm-hmm. And we didn't want people to come to the store and like, oh, I'm looking for this game. And then yeah. you know, it might be rented out. That'd be super awkward. So we just want to keep the collection as is fully in stock in the store at all times. Yeah. Although it is great to know that that's a model that can work for you. Because, I mean, hopefully we will not go through yeah, fear of a shutdown again. But it's kind of nice to know that that's an option, you know, if it's ever mm-hmm. Like in the future. So speaking of all of your games that you have, what would you say is are like, like just hands down some of the most popular ones that you got? I'm just curious. Yeah. So a lot of the people coming to our cafe, uh, the most popular games are definitely the most mainstream ones. Games like Monopoly, Jenga, mm-hmm. Uno, your classics, and I feel like they always hit home because people usually know how to play them, and if they don't, it takes like five minutes to learn. And you're getting right into the action of mm-hmm. things. Other popular games that are more up and coming, maybe a little bit more niche games like Ticket to Ride, Splendor, uh, Settlers of Catan. These games are more board gamey. Um, mm-hmm. Not everyone might know it, but they're getting more and more popular. Yeah, I've definitely heard my friends like talk about Settlers of Catan. Like that's a very, yeah. you know, people are very into that one. I still haven't had a chance to play that one yet. Oh, yeah. um, that'll change at your cafe <laughs> at some point, you know, in the future. I have, I, 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 you know, I have schemes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so as far as like, because, you know, you're, you're a Brooklyn local you have a business in the Park Slope community. Like, what, what have you enjoyed so far about being part of this Park Slope business community? So what, what I've learned is that Park Slope is actually, like, a beautiful neighborhood. Um, I actually moved to Park Slope a year and a oh, half ago. Oh, okay. So yeah, you are, so not just in Brooklyn, you are in Park Slope yourself. I'm in a Park Slope Together group. Um, I'm part of all, like, the shenanigans. And I realized that it's a really cute neighborhood. I feel like there's a much more community feel to it and I feel connected to their, to everyone here, especially also, you know, having the business here too, connecting with other business owners and actually having like new friends in the neighborhood, like um, knowing people at the, the local bar, or, like the local bodega, things like that. Uh, it's making me really feel connected to the parcel community, whereas uh, the neighborhood I grew up in, I never really had that experience. Yeah, no, it really, that is, again, like the interconnectedness that I think is just really one of the, one of the neighborhood strengths, because that's the thing, it's like there's every neighborhood around the city has its own character, but I do think that there are some neighborhoods that just really do feel like their own like kind of microcosm or really their own um kind of towns and stuff which actually i guess shouldn't be too surprising considering that a lot of communities especially in brooklyn and queens actually used to be (laughs) independent towns at some point i don't know if park slope was ever one of them i know that uh places like flatbush and uh gravesend uh used to be like their own independent kind of areas and especially yeah and especially in queens it's part of the reason why you have like all these uh it, rather than it just being queen sometimes on the uh, mailing address, you have like these different, like, it's like, oh, it'll, yeah. be, it'll, it'll be this or something like we're story or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not too surprising, but Park Slope really is one of those that it's like you come and you feel like there that you are in a town that exists within a city, which is pretty mm-hmm. neat because you get the benefits I think of uh, both worlds. So actually speaking of the neighborhood and to kind of wrap up uh, this really fun interview, what are some of your favorite places in the neighborhood so far? You don't have to rattle off all of them, obviously, because I'm sure there's so many businesses here, but just like a few that come uh, top of mind. Yeah. I remember um, first moving here, I actually made a post in the Park Slope Together group. What are your favorite restaurants in Park Slope? (laughs) And some hotspots are definitely, 
Piety Law. I pass by that restaurant every mm. every, every day, and their pasta is amazing. <clears throat> I also really like. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. Bricolage. Yeah, Bricolage. Oh, That's it. Bricolage. it. The Mies restaurant. Mm-hmm. Love that place. Skylark is like the closest bar. Um, always nice to go over there. They've helped me out a bunch. When like there was one time some play our ice machine was down, and Skylark was really nice, and they you know helped us get some ice. Oh, um, that's nice. Yeah, I love them. So I'd say off the top of my head, those three are kind of like favorite spots to go to local in the area. Oh, that's great! Like I actually haven't had a chance to go to Skylark Bar, so I'll no have way. to. I'll have to. I'll have yeah. to like take a little peek and see what they're about. But anywho. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. And actually, um, so can you tell folks the address uh, for Sip and Play Cafe, as well as what your Instagram account is? For sure. Uh, we are based uh, 471 Fifth Avenue, which is on Fifth Ave between 10th and 11th Street. Our Instagram handle is Sip and Play NYC, letter N in the middle. And um, yeah, hope to see you soon there. All right. So thanks again so much for taking time out of your busy schedule because business owners be busy. <laughs> so thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. It was really, really great getting to know you a bit better as well as your business. And thank you all for tuning in for this edition. And I will see you again next time. Bye. Bye.